Thank you very much, Connor and Roger, and thank you everyone for attending this joint session. Um, what I'm going to try and do in the next 15 minutes is give you a framework of operating on obese patients with colorectal uh, laparoscopy. But really, most of the talk just has to do with operating on obese patients in the non-bariatric world for most of us. Um, I have no disclosures. What I'd like to do really is talk a little bit about obesity itself, both in the U.S. and worldwide, um, talk about the outcomes uh, that have been published um, for laparoscopic colorectal surgery in obese patients, and then talk about sort of the framework and what we all have to think about, both preoperatively, intraoperatively, and uh, postoperatively in these patients who, you know, are significantly large. Um, you know, it's a huge problem. I mean, I think that we all recognize it certainly here in the United States. Um, but the World Health Organization has also recognized it. Uh, being overweight and being obese is one of the top five risk conditions uh, throughout the entire world. And if you really look at it from a numbers standpoint, there's more than one billion people who are overweight and there's 300 million people that are considered obese. And we'll go into some of those uh, specific definitions in a second. And in the U.S., you know, secondary to tobacco, I mean, other than tobacco in preventable deaths in the United States, um, the second leading cause is really conditions that are related to obesity. Um, and it's really 16% of all the preventable deaths in, in the United States are due to obesity. Um, and it's really 400,000 deaths annually. So it's a huge amount of people that you know, potentially can be prevented from, from dying because of obesity. And what you see in this little cartoon down here is that, you know, we've, you know, definitely changed as time has gone on. But what's one of the things that's happened, and there's a variety of factors, some may be genetic, certainly some have to do with sedentary lifestyles and things like that, but we're evolving to, um, you know, a species that, you know, conserves energy and becomes fat. And that's a big problem because us as surgeons have to operate on some of these people. It's one thing if you're a bariatric surgeon and you're making these people smaller, but it's another thing to be a colorectal surgeon or a general surgeon and sort of need to operate on these people. And we all know, I think, what the degrees of obesity are, but it's not uncommon, and you'll see some data in a minute, that we're operating on people with BMIs of 30, 40, and sometimes even greater than that, and that you know, poses particular challenges. Certainly here in the U.S., essentially one in three people can be considered overweight or obese. So it's very likely that in any given week or any given month that we are going to be operating on someone who, you know, has specific challenges related to the fact that they are overweight or obese, which really makes the challenges to us as the surgeon because it's clearly uh, going to be somewhat more difficult. So what options do we have as a surgeon in someone, you know, when you see a patient who comes to you and they're significantly overweight or obese? Well, one option is don't operate on them. Um, you can do that in certain situations potentially where you can try and encourage weight loss. Um, you know, certainly elective operations, uh, abdominal hernia type of operations, potentially patients with inflammatory bowel disease who could potentially have a staged operation. You can sort of put the carrot in front of them that you'll do their subtotal colectomy, but they won't get their pouch until things are better, you know, from a weight uh, standpoint. Um, there are even times, and, and we've done this on about six to eight occasions, where patients have had uh, the need for elective surgery in the future, potentially, and actually sent them for bariatric procedures to make our job and to make their outcomes potentially better. Um, you could always do open surgery. Um, it, it has its own issues. Or as you'll see, you can do laparoscopic surgery or minimally invasive surgery, but just optimize the outcomes as best as possible. You know, the initial experience for many people when they started off doing laparoscopic colorectal surgery was that the overweight patient or the obese patient was excluded, you know, from the technique because it was technically more difficult there was a higher conversion rate, and if you remember the early laparoscopic colorectal surgery data, conversions often led to worse outcomes, and that was for a variety of different reasons. I think now, you know, that's not necessarily the case, but in the early days it was, so that the fact that 
we didn't want to have high conversion rates led us to potentially exclude patients who would potentially benefit uh, from this. And a lot of these cases, at least early on, were difficult, and we were at the beginning of our learning curve. You know, but I think we also recognize that open surgery isn't necessarily easy in obese patients, and it has its own issues, particularly related to access issues, wound issues, and long-term hernia issues uh, when you make a big incision. Um, and those are the things that, you know, I sort of just uh, spoke about. But, you know, um, you know, you often in these patients need a bigger incision. Even if you're able to do things laparoscopically or minimally invasively, it has to be somewhat bigger than it would normally be in a thinner patient because you have to traverse the abdominal wall. The specimens themselves are somewhat bigger, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that's, you know, e even in open surgery that can be a lot more difficult um, is the splenic flexure mobilization and the pelvic dissection. So offering these patients an open operation is not necessarily uh, a panacea. You know, we looked at our data. We were one of the first groups to publish specifically on um, surgery in the obesity. Uh, this is a paper that was uh, lead author was Alan Pekarsky from Israel. And we looked at 162 patients who uh, had a segmental colorectal resection. Um, 19% of these patients were obese. We had a really significant conversion rate at that point, you know, almost three times as high in the obese patient than in the non-obese patient. The post-op complications were also about three times as high in that particular group of patients. Um, these are the kinds of uh, issues that we had. Um, the, the, the ileus and wound infection rates were the main uh, issues, and the length of stay was a little bit longer. But still, when you compared these back to historical controls in open surgery, we, we were still doing better offering these patients a laparoscopic approach. Um, Tony Senegor um, and colleagues uh, looked at 260 patients. I think this is Connor's data too. Um, you know, obese and non-obese patients. The obese group had significantly higher conversion rates. Again, not quite as high uh, as in our group. And I think that you can always anticipate that these operations are going to take longer because they are more difficult. Um, there's definitely going to be a higher morbidity rate. Again, a lot of this is wound related, but it can be related to some other things. In this paper, there was a slightly higher leak rate, but that's not borne out in many of the other studies. Um, and again, when you compare it back to, you know, open patients, you get benefit from it even though there's more complications than your non-obese patients. Oliver Schwander, um, a prospective study of 589 patients, um, of which 16% of these were obese. In their series, there was actually no significant difference in conversion rate, but this is a little bit later data, so maybe surmounting the learning curve. Um, and there were no significant complication rates that were different in, in respect to BMI. Um, so in, in their series, a little bit safer. Joel Lara, um, looking at 111 patients with specifically left colectomy, 20% of those patients being obese, um, no conversions in the obese group. Again, going a little bit further along the learning curve, 2005 versus 2002, plus a very technically adept surgeon. Um, and interestingly enough, in their series, the obese patients actually had a shorter length of stay than the non-obese patients. But again, all of these things are saying that people are willing to do surgery in these particular patients who are obese because it does offer advantages. And this is um, a, a very recent NISQIP um, study from the U.S. looking at a variety of patients and grouping them. Um, based on BMI. And what you can see is that people are operating on patients with malignancies, patients with benign disease, patients with inflammatory bowel disease, and all, all the way up to the super obese categories. And essentially, other than longer lengths of time and wound infection rates, which you'll see on these two slides, which do increase with increasing BMI, the otherwise outcomes are about the same. So I think that we can get relatively good outcomes albeit understanding that there's going to be increased wound infections in most people's hands, there's going to be a higher conversion rate, um, and it's going to directly correlate with how big the patients potentially are. So we will be doing surgery in obese patients. So what do we have to know and what can we do? Well, one thing is we all have to be familiar with the fact of what bariatric operations some of these patients may either have or have had in, in, in the past, because you will be asked to operate on people who have had 
one form of bariatric surgery or another, and it may play a role in how you choose your port sites, where the limbs of the you know, different anastomoses are in relation to the colon. And most of us are not bariatric surgeons, but I think we have to be familiar with all of the techniques. So whether it's you know, uh, gastric bypass, banding, sleeves, which don't really have too much, but then something as complicated as a duodenal switch can really mar the landmarks for us and, and the anatomy. So you have to be familiar with that. I think the preoperative evaluation is much more critical in patients who have, uh, you know, who are obese because they have a lot of comorbidities. And managing these and optimizing these before surgery, I think, is important when you can. So really working in a team approach with your endocrinologist, with your cardiologist, and things like that to try and get some of these things in as best control as possible is really, really important. Um, some other preoperative considerations are sometimes you can't get the imaging that you want. Uh, certain, uh, you know, there are certain weight limits in certain hospitals on the CT machines that they have. The image quality is also somewhat poor, so you don't always get as good of a roadmap as you may have in the past. And most of these patients are going to require some form of endoscopy. And although not everybody uses, uh, you know, a MAC uh, type of anesthesia, I think for the obese patient, to be able to have an anesthesiologist present and to be able to have airway management when it's needed, because a lot of these patients have sleep apnea and some other things, they tend to obstruct their airways a little bit more, uh, may be better. The other thing is the typical clear liquid NPO uh, requirements for sedation um, may be longer than uh, what you would normally do at two hours. So that, because these patients have delayed gastric emptying, so you may want to keep these patients truly MPO for about six hours. Um, from your anesthetic colleague standpoint and from just your, 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 your OR time, um, it's not uncommon in the real big patients to need to do awake fiber optic intubations. Um, depending on the weight of the patient, you may have to use special OR tables to be able to, you know, get the patients to be able to be maneuvered in a variety of positions because um, not all tables, again, will allow patients over three or 400 pounds to be on that table depending on what you're operating on. It's really important to secure your patients just like you do in every laparoscopic operation, but, it, but, 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 but even more so here. And just the size and the weight of their extremities can, can lead to significant issues with uh, nerve type injuries, so perineal nerve injuries and things like that, ul ulnar nerve injuries, so you really got to pad the arms and legs uh, much more than you would necessarily in a non-obese patient. The other thing is, is that the standard instrumentation that we often use um, may be too short. So, uh, so I think you have to be, you know, have bar bariatric size instruments in the room for some of these cases. The other thing that you can do is you can medialize your ports. So instead of putting your ports laterally, if you move your ports in more medially, you may be able to reach with non-bariatric instruments. There are a lot of physiologic issues that have to do with obesity. These patients have uh, a higher bleeding tendency uh, for a variety of different reasons. They have uh, higher uh, pressures in their airways, particularly when you're in Steve Trendelenburg position, which may cause problems uh, from a ventilatory standpoint. Your anesthesia colleagues recognize that, but we don't necessarily always recognize that. And due to the patient's abdominal girth and the non-flexibility of a lot of their abdominal walls, they often develop an intra-abdominal compartment syndrome during the surgery. Not that it's super clinically relevant, but the urine outputs tend to drop off and some other things, which you also see with other uh, laparoscopic surgery. Um, there are some anatomic issues specifically uh, related to um, the obese patient. Um, you know, just standard things like getting IV access may have to be done ultrasound guided and central line access may be more necessary in these patients than in your standard patients. Gaining initial abdominal access, uh, creating your pneumoperitoneum. I mean, some of these abdominal walls are really thick, and even though I'm a big proponent normally of open access, I think in these patients, closed access, either with varies needle or varies needle and optical trocar, makes a lot more sense. Um, again, with your secondary port placement, medialize your ports. And if you're going to use a hand-assisted approach, you know, instead of, you know, you want to stay away from the panis, and you may have to move your ports up much more superiorly towards the umbilicus, even though it may not be the, uh, 
best place uh, from a, just from a surgical perspective. Um, extraction sites, um, again, stay away from the panis and the lower abdomen, so you may want to use upper abdominal sites, which are a little bit different. Um, and this may be one of the significant benefits to doing intracorporeal anastomosis, particularly in an obese patient, so you can really extract where, wherever you want instead of the standard extraction sites, which most of us use, which tend to be in the lower abdomen, which would not be favorable for, you know, for, for the obese patients. Um, other things when you're creating stomas, um, the abdominal wall can be a real uh, particular problem and dividing the mesentery instead of in single layers, sometimes you'll have to do it in multiple layers. Using something like an Alexis, a small Alexis wound retractor to compress the abdominal wall and bring the stoma through uh, can help in obese patients. And switching to a, an end loop or a loop end stoma as opposed to a true end can also help when the mesentery is really thickened. Um, there's a lot of things you have to do in the post-operative period that are a little bit different, um, you know, and things that we take for granted um, can be more difficult. Um, there's a lot of things to consider there. And again, the wound complications, you should expect some of these things to happen. So in conclusion, up to about 30% of the patients, at least here in the United States, that we operate on may be obese. Um, it's not on only an anatomic problem, but a disease because of the multiple comorbidities. Um, expect a longer OR duration, expect higher morbidity, particularly re re related to wounds, and expect to convert more, but in the long run, it's still better than open surgery. Thank you.